Welcome to Turmeric and Tequila with your host, Kristen Olson. Questioning a better way, one gracefully disruptive conversation at a time. Welcome to Turmeric and Tequila. Today I have a podcast, digital media, all around a uh, great guy coming to the mic. We have, he's our worlds we're just discussing have been in circular motion because of podcasting, which is such a blessing because you already know, I consider him one of my varsity humans. Uh, I'm welcoming Josh Carey to the mic today. He is the co-founder of PodMax, founder of his own podcast, The Hidden Entrepreneur, which we're going to totally unpack. In addition to a business coach, a speaker, a digital media consultant and entrepreneur, um, and he's really working to help entrepreneurs unmask themselves and help them reach the levels of success they so desperately crave. Josh, welcome. Oh, thank you, Kristen. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a long time coming. I'm glad we've been yes. crossing paths, and this is a great path to continue to cross. I completely agree. It's we'll, we'll say it's the orange brick road just because of um, oh. turmeric is orange. So, you know, we're here. Oh, uh, <laughs> but I, I want to jump right in because I was digging through, I mean, we've had a couple conversations now, but I was digging through some of your background and uh, it was a little more diverse than I thought. We, we had like a pet business or so, I mean, you know, I've, I have two dogs and I'm actually about to get my third on Thursday. I haven't even announced oh, cool. this yet, my third rescue. So I'm here for the animals. Can we talk about that really quick? And then we're going to get into yeah. like the juice. Yeah, we could talk about anything. Um, so, so yeah, there. Um, I find myself in a very interesting. I guess that's one way to put it. I I really, for the first time in life, I'm just loving life. Right, I'm. Six years old today. I have two children, you know, seven year old daughter, a five year old son. They're my everything. They've become the reason that I am today. But like, I find myself in the best shape of my life, in the most energy of the most healthy of my all of that, right? And I, I sometimes lose sight of that there is a whole. 40 plus year, you know, professional and struggling and trying history that I was a part of. Um, I spent 15 years as an actor and filmmaker, which I absolutely love and adore. And like you said, you picked out one of my uh, somewhat recent careers. I spent 10 years uh, in the, uh, really running my own digital marketing agency, building websites, uh, helping with SEO and Google rankings and uh, website optimization and how to get client conversion and all of that. And I found myself being able to do that specifically for the professional pet industry. And uh, I, I had come from the world of building my own websites and small business websites and making that work. Then uh, at the time, you know, 15 years ago or so, the girl I was dating at the time and I, we started our own pet and dog walking company. I had built the website because I knew how to do that, which ranked well in Google, which got clients. So I made that a successful business. And then I just started poking around. I said, let me see what other professional dog walking companies are doing. And I said, oh my goodness, there's an opportunity here. They have the best- yeah, they have the best intentions. Also, because I noticed that they have the best intentions. They were run just by, you know, men and women who just want to walk the dogs and are throwing up a site and hoping for the best. And I'm like, ooh, they're missing the mark on even the <laughs> basics here. I can come in because I know how to build sites. I know I already have the proof in the pudding here. I built my own site, my own company in the space. And I just started writing articles and giving tips and ideas of how to make small tweaks to your website and get them into the search engines and grow your base. And it got traction. And I said, well, this is now going to be a legitimate business. And that turned into 10 years of, I became, you know, I, I became quite a name in that industry. I, uh, for, for, for seven consecutive years, I held my own uh, industry conference out in Las Vegas because I love Vegas and I could host it there. And each year I just went back there and it was great. So um, it was a good run. It, it, it was a good industry. It was niche. And everybody who I spoke to about it was just fascinated. They're like, what yeah. a great idea to just serve that niche. Well, did you, and the reason I ask, obviously I'm like a super, I want to say dog human, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, but it's kind of like, you know, cross it lacrosse pocket. It's like a very niche, like some of my favorite people in the world are dog people or cat people, like pet people. Um, were you a dog or animal enthusiast prior? Like, did it stem from like very organic space? 
Well, yes. Um, I, <laughs> that I sounds lo- like a sorta. <laughs> Um, no, it, 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 it absolutely was. I've been okay. a dog person my whole life. I grew up with dogs. Uh, when I was a young adult and living on my own, I, 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 um, I had dogs. Then I got the opportunity to start my own pet sitting and dog walking business. And I think you really have to enjoy pets to really oh, yeah. make that work. So, um, I didn't, you know, I wasn't an exclusion to that fact. So yeah, I, I've always been a dog and pet person. I just think it's such a good qualifier. Like if you are doing business, like I always kind of like to work with athletes or what have you, but I'm like, Oh, I have a dog or a pet. I'm like, Oh, okay. One more, one more star in the box for us to work together. Uh, Cause I think it's sure. really revealing, but good for you from like, finding an angle to monetize it because I, it's huge business. Uh, mm. But just like nutrition, I always love to see it stem from like really genuine space and it being like, you know, dog people versus someone that's like, Oh my God, there's great margin in this. Let's build a business out of it and be disconnected oh, yeah. from the cause. But that happens all the yeah. time too. So that's either right. way. Um, I, I do want to get like to the juice of things. You said this a couple times and when you interviewed me, we didn't really get into it, uh, you know, on your side, but you talked about podcasting, saving your life. And I love that you just prefaced it as, you know, as we reflect and we're excited to wake up in the day. Cause I'm with you now, you, as we know, I just turned 40 and people are like, Oh, is it crazy? Is it whatever? And I'm like, nah, you know, I'm kind of on top of the hill essentially. Like I'm, we've done all this work. It's all these breakdown breakthroughs personally, professionally, like you got some notches on the belt at this point. And it's kind of nice to be like, I, I think I know something. I think I know what I want to be doing. I'm, I mm. absolutely love podcasting, uh, but it was, it's been a journey. Tell us a little bit about um, how you initially got into podcasting. And I saw some acting, some professional situations kind of on the mic, if you will. How did podcasting come in and how did it save your life? Well, it's, uh, it, it's really funny you bring up the acting because to this day, I always feel like I'm just back at my roots. Like I am professionally trained there, lots of stage, lots of film credits. I, I like being uh, on the stage and in front of people. So I always say that it's not the biggest stretch that I am a podcast host now. And it also plays and uses a lot of the training and technique that I've learned, right? Communication skills. Come on. That's all it's about too. Uh, So I'm using all that. So um, when I was, when I was in the digital marketing space, running that for the pet industry, that was sort of the tail end of when I was at my lowest for the 40 plus years, you know, my story, I'm the hidden entrepreneur spent 40 plus years hiding, showing up in every situation, hiding everything that I was truly capable of doing because I didn't want to rock the boat. And I was desperately seeking your approval. And it gets very tiring very quickly. But the biggest frustration was that I would then come home behind closed doors, know darn well what I was capable of doing, yet resisting it. Because I felt if I dare showed up showing what I'm capable of, it might make you feel insecure about what you're doing or not doing. And if I was the reason you're feeling insecure and shining a light on that, you might retaliate and come at me. And who do you think you are? Get out of here with that stuff or worse. And I didn't feel like I'd be strong enough to stick up or stand up for myself. So I avoided that all together. And that's what caused the whole thing. And now, like I said earlier, I credit my two adoring children for giving me that strength, really for being the mirror that I desperately needed because early on in their young lives, I realized I I see what's happening here. I'm the one throwing the temper tantrum and I'm the child in this circle and I'm the one who has work to do. So I said, you guys keep, keep showing up, doing beautifully and amazingly what you're doing. I'm going to get myself a little better than, than this. And I, I made that choice. I made that decision to just start replacing some of the bad negative habits, patterns, and beliefs with slightly better ones thinking like, well, you know what, let's, let's start easy. I should probably stop doing that every single night. I should probably adjust how I do that in the afternoons, maybe adjust this and then just one by one doing it. And I started seeing the positive result of it. And I said, "Mm -hmm, that worked. I feel good about that. Let's keep doing that for a little while. Not to get any sort of overwhelm, but just to say, okay, that worked. Let me do that. 
Let me add this to the mix and that to the mix. And slowly but surely it compounds on itself and, you know, becomes great momentum for a life well lived. And here we are. So when I made that transition of, you know what, I have to find something to do. I sort of have to break from this digital marketing firm that I'm running here for myself and just cut ties and start fresh. But I don't know what that is going to be or look like, but I trust it. I said, I'll figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I, I took a few months and I said, well, I think hidden entrepreneur that came to me and it felt right. And I figured it out and I wrote what that means and what it would look like and started telling that story of who I am, where I want to go, where I'm taking this. And I said, you know what? Podcasting. I never really did it. I probably, I was just drawn to it. I said, I'd probably be good at it. I felt that I want to talk to people. I, I, I've always been, you know, asking a lot of questions and the curious guy. And why do you ask so many questions? And that person. So I, I knew that I'd be enjoy the podcasting space. And I said, well, it'll, it'll give me a chance to document what I'm going through, to connect with individuals one-on-one. -on -one. And I said, that's got to position me for opportunity that I will look for and grab. And I did. One interview became two, became three, became five. And then after a while, 10 and 50, now I'm almost 180 episodes in. But along the way, one of my guests early on said to me after the show, he said, you know, I've done interviews before and this was literally the best interview ever. So now I'm getting positive affirmation and feedback that what I'm doing is working. And I'm like, yeah, this is great. It feels good. I'm doing it. I'm making connections. I'm making it happen. Then uh, last year, I was at a podcasting event where I got to record episodes of my show. And one of the guests that I was randomly matched with was Eric Cabral, which who has since become my oh. business partner in everything that I'm doing. I didn't know yeah. that. Okay. Yeah. And after the show, I mean, he was just some guy from Jersey, like I'm some guy from Jersey. <laughs> After the show, he said, you know, I got a studio in New Jersey. You should probably come out and check it out and see what's what. And I said, okay, fine. yeah, that'd be great. And I did, and I showed up, and I continued showing up, and the rest is history, as they say. But I always like to point out that if I wasn't already the kind of person that was able to attract that kind of opportunity in advance – instead of hoping for the external opportunity to present itself and then I'll make the change because it doesn't happen like that. If I wasn't already that person, somebody like Eric wouldn't have felt inspired to say, I like you. I like what you're doing. Come and uh, spend time, spend time in my, in my studio. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, that's huge. And thank you for sharing that, the, the journey and the pieces, because it all kind of fits together and not one thing doesn't evolve without everything evolving uh, at full capacity. How, but what, I'm really curious when you said you had started to have this self-awareness, because that's very evolved conversation around having that self-awareness of it's not you, it's me. And I am dimming my light. I am doing these things. What, I mean, how did you pivot through that? Did you seek out like coaching or therapy or was your wife like, mm, something's up here? Like, how was that pivot point specifically? A little bit of all of that, right? Um, I started, um, I, I've always been into self-awareness and self-growth and personal development growing okay. up through the years, but often it just doesn't land, right? You, you just don't see the change until you're ready for it. And all, all things aligned at that time. And I guess just, you know, when you have children, that really for me at least, was the, was the ultimate mirror that I needed. And I was like, you know what? I always knew that I wanted to be a father. I was always excited by that idea. And now given the chance, I wasn't going to mess it up. I wasn't, I, I, I felt and knew better that I couldn't continue to be the kind of person I was in front of them because I knew that then that's how they would be in the world. And that would just devastate me growing up 15, 20 years into the future. Now I'm in a uh, empty house here and my children are on their own and they're seeking approval and angry and miserable and who knows what I'm like, no, 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 no. Now's the time I, I can and have to make this, this move and just everything aligned. And uh, yeah, I, I did get a coach uh, um, on that outset to help me through it. And that worked. And then just slowly but surely all the pieces come together. 
I, that's amazing. I think it's so important for everyone to further this message around, uh, again, coaching, therapy, life, co- however you label it. Uh, just like athletes, if you want to get to the next level, you really need someone that's better than you and specifically good at that skill set to help guide you to the next level. And, uh, you know, I, I still think there's kind of a stigma around it, particularly for men. Um, but it's, it's one of the best decisions you could ever make. I, when I reflect on money I've spent on coaches, like athletically, it's ridiculous, let alone, you know, MRIs and, you know, recovery and all the stuff you'd pay to go with it, nutrition. Um, but the mental side of it, the life coaching, the um, brain therapy, like all this stuff that I've been fortunate to be exposed to because what I get to do it professionally, but really spend and invest on my own mental health, if you will best money ever spent. Um, And I always say for my young humans, if they could hear our stories and our messages and streamline some of that process instead of of maybe, you know, 30 or 40, they're talking about it at 15 or 20. um, I think that would be massive world impact if everybody kind of took care of themselves first. And then we came to the table to, you know, solve the world's problems. Um, But I I also liked that you said that that personal responsibility around our young humans and, and, you know, your kiddos are looking directly at you. And, you know, if it's not your kids, it's influencer marketing. It's what you're putting out there. Other people are seeing it and what you're attracting and bringing in. Um, And I also like that you said you, you knew you had to make a switch, but you didn't know what's next. And I think that's big because the pivot point of where I want to change, I want to have present myself differently. The second you do that, the right things come in, the right opportunities come in. And it's important to acknowledge it, that what you're going to do, like podcasting, for example, 10 years ago, wasn't even in my world. Like I didn't know what it was, but as I was going on, like this thing became a thing. So I think sometimes you don't even really have to know the how, like you just have to keep showing up and let things unfold um, for you to be like, oh, oh my God, this is a thing. Like, this is really cool. Did you know anything about podcasting prior or did you just kind of jump on the mic and be like, this is it? No, I knew a little bit in terms okay. of, um, I, prior to making the Hidden Entrepreneur podcast, an official podcast with all the steps properly in place. Prior to that, I did interview people along my years for my industry, you know, doing like the live interviews in the groups and on the pages sure. and all that. So um, I wasn't new to that aspect, but I was new to making an official business model out of it for an end goal that I'm aware of in and of itself, which was the marketing arm to the Hidden Entrepreneur brand, which at the time was, was coaching. Right. I knew right. that um, it would it would help me establish a, a, a place in the podcasting industry because that's really what I wanted out of the gate. I felt so drawn to it that I said, I think this is where I belong. I just felt it. Right. And I said, so how do I get there? Well, I have to prove that I'm in the space and that I'm a podcaster and that I have a show and I'm decent at this and meet people along the way and see what opportunities there are and go and hang out in the groups and make connections and show show up at the, at the conferences and here we are. Yeah. I, I, uh, the, the power of showing up and just being there. I think when you're new too, you got to just like grind, like you're not making money off anything yet. You're still pretty raw in the game. Even you have come with experience. Like when I went from lacrosse to CrossFit, you know, I was coming off a top 20 D one team, but I wasn't good at CrossFit. Like I didn't know how to do those mm. things. It was fitness, but you know, five bands on the pull-up bar, but like very basic level. I think you have to have that very humble entrance of like, let's just jump in. Let's take every opportunity that comes at us and let's just learn the ropes, see, you know, the humans that are in this community. And then, you know, start to see where you fall. And like you said, prove yourself. Um, and that's, I, 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 as you get older, we're, we're not as used to doing that. You know, kiddos, you show up on the playground, you fall off the monkey bars, you get back up, you keep, you do it again. As we get older, we kind of get set into our ways. So it's kind of like revisiting our young selves of like, Oh, like I might fail at this. This might be a huge bomb. We're going to do it. But like, this could be bad. Did you have any like failure or fear of failure coming into it? I know you talk specifically around fear, um, but was that something you had to resist along the way? Well, it, yes, of course. And to overcome that, it helps to know why in, why in the world you're doing the thing you're doing. I got clear out of the gate with why I was showing up to record episodes of the show. Um, And that's why I I wound up batching so many in the first few months that I had to, first I was releasing once a week 
and then twice a week and then three times a week because I double downed in this. And I said, I want to in the, basically in the shortest amount of time possible establish that I'm a, a show host here, right? So if I have a few shows, then I have several shows, then I have 20, 30, 40, 50 shows. Now it's somewhat legitimate. And I wanted that milestone so I could show up and, and be respected and admired and make those connections in the space. But in terms of fear, of course, that still happens. And what I've learned for myself, and this is what I also teach, is what helps me frame all of this. And I know you and I have spoken about the, um, the, uh, uh, the way life is, is fleeting, right? And, and we're here one minute and, and, and we know what can happen in any other minute. But what I've done to help me put it into perspective uh, is to be able to answer one big question, which is simply, how would you like to be remembered? Now I take that question and I answer it for myself because best case scenario, my life is half over, right? That's best case scenario. If I live another 45 years, I'm into my nineties. That's fantastic. That's not tragic, right? That's like a great life. So what I've been able to do by answering the question, how I would like to be remembered really helps me alleviate much of the fear that would be in place because what is the fear really most often it's about? It's about how we're going to look, how we're going to sound, what people are going to think that most often is what prevents us from doing anything, doing the very things we know darn well we are capable of doing. I spent my life knowing full well what I was capable of doing, but resisted doing it because I didn't want to make you feel awkward. Imagine that. Really think about that. If that's not a waste of time slash a waste of life, right? Because yeah. it's my life. It's my days here. What is? So we are all just so, so concerned with how we're going to look. Am I going to look silly? Am I going to look foolish? Am I going to embarrass myself? What are people going to say or think that I would rather just do nothing? But by answering the question deeply for yourself, how would you like to be remembered? You alleviate it because now it takes the responsibility off everything. Meaning I don't have to worry about when I make a move, what you're going to think, because it doesn't matter because I am so dialed in to how I would like to be remembered that I've given all of my actions that connection. So whatever I'm doing is, has already been answered for myself tied into my children as well. So it doesn't concern you in the best possible way, which gives me the freedom to go out and joyfully express and see how it lands, not concerning what others are going to think, because I've done the due diligence in knowing why I'm taking any single action that I am taking. Uh, that's incredibly well said. And identifying that deep why or how you want to be remembered is really intense and something I've had a really wake, a deep awakening around uh, about podcasting and our voices because I'm big around responsibility and the messages we're putting out there and I've, I've done a lot of that with influencer marketing because of my consulting uh, firm KO Alliance. However, when I really think about podcasting, I'm like, oh my God, this is going to be out here forever. Like we're putting this out and you know, no one ever hears it or whatever, either way it's out into the universe and it's recorded. If we disappeared tomorrow, there's, you know, 200 episodes, 60 something episodes of our voices out there. Um, how heavy of a responsibility do you take in, in putting out your authentic voice? And I know we don't overly edit. I know we're conscious, but how much does that weigh into or inspire you to show up on the mic as best you can? Well, completely. So much so that sometimes if I get a thought or an idea and I want to make a, um, I want to make a video about it, I might be resistant or hesitant about it saying, Hmm. And I'll feel it like, Oh, or am I going to, am I going to sound silly? Or am I going to be embarrassed? Or what could pe people possibly say negatively about this? And then I'll weigh that. I'll think about it. But then that very thing is what allows me to still go forward, right? You know, the definition of, of courage, it's still moving forward in spite of the fear. So that's exactly what it is. So even though I'm, I'm, I'm aware of what could possibly be said, 
I'm playing it out in my mind where I've diffused that situation, tie it back into how I want to be remembered, say, okay, this is, in, this is completely in line. If anything, I certainly have to come out with this video now, taking this stand or giving this side of the coin because that's, that's who I am and that's what I've chosen to stand for. So it makes things a little easier. That's, I think that's amazing. I think that's for anyone that will be listening is a good note to uh, write down because it's that practice is applicable to anything you do and everything you do. Um, I always try and keep something in the back of my mind. Like it's not going to be perfect. I've, we've done human, human management. We see the, the mistakes and my main why was just authenticity. Um, so I always try and weigh out like there's going to be haters. There's going to be critiques. There's, it's going to be imperfect. And some of it's going to be like, I listen to some of my first episodes or oh. first workouts or first whatever. And it's like, Oh, you know, cringe. Like this is really raw. <laughs> but again, back to the why is, well, yes, we have some people that will not approve or not like it or whatever, but if there are ones that there is impact and it did help, that's all that matters. And if it resonates, you know, with the cliche, if it helps one person, then it's all worth it. Um, I think that's so true. And I deal with a lot of people, and I don't know if you see this in your consulting, that that fear paralyzes them so deeply. And these are really great qualified, again, varsity people that absolutely should have their voice on the mic, on camera, writing or whatever it is but they're so worried about making it perfect. It takes them years to get it out. And I'm like, just, just be okay with it. Not being perfect. Um, hmm. do you, do you deal with that in your consulting side? Yeah. And it's, it, it really, be, and, and I'm only able to say this because I've recognized it in myself mm -hmm. with, through the self-awareness. What so much of what we do is a habit, is habitual. All of our actions and reactions and emotions, many of them, the emotions we feel are habitual, which means we are not consciously choosing these emotions. We are just repeating over and over again in the course of a day, the same feelings by experiencing the same uh, actions and reactions over and over again. So unless you find yourself in a situation where you're able to stop the emotion and say, wait a minute, why am I really feeling this? Yeah, on the surface, you know what happened because they cut me off or that person said that again, or this happened to me again. But you got to go deeper and just figure out what is happening. A whole other conversation, self-sabotage, which is a real thing and true as day, uh, my goodness. So figure out if it's self-sabotage, why? What are you really trying to avoid? Is it a level of success or a level of achievement or acknowledgement? Go deep and just figure out why that is and see what you can do. Uh, I'll briefly walk you through one of these um, one of these other things that I take my clients through is uh, a little program called F That Noise which has become an acronym for N-O-I-S-E, which is really how you identify the overriding emotions you're feeling in the course of any given day and how you can step out of it. Because again, it's all a habit that we just you know find ourselves in. But going through this N-O-I-S-E, F that noise uh, training program allows you to identify and remove and separate yourself from the emotions that are immediately triggered in any given day. So you want me to go quickly through what they each mean and how yeah, you can apply it? You don't even have to go quickly. The noise was on my um, list. And ironically, I always talk about uh, breaking through or blocking the noise because in reference to, like social media, when I was reading through all your stuff, I'm like, of course I cross paths with this human. Like there's so many things, but yeah, take your time, take us through it. This is a meaningful piece. All right. Well, thank you. So like I said, it's going to help you identify the overriding emotion. So um, sure, at any given moment, there could be a few emotions. But what you want to do first is identify, pick, pick one that is in your world most often, and we'll go with that. So the first thing you want to do is the N, which is name that emotion right? Put a name to it. Is it anger? Is it despair? Is it frustration? Is it disappointment? Is it jealousy, right? What is the overriding emotion? Put a name to it. Then the O, we move on. Now you want to own that emotion. You know it. It's yours and yours alone, which gives you the power and the ability to make the change that you want to make. It's not about somebody else changing like I experienced with my children. I'm not going to sit all my life hoping 
hoping that they're going to stop doing the certain things that get me upset because it's not about them. It's about me. It's my emotion. And I own that. Then the I, you want to identify with it. First, you want to say, I am, I am angry. I am disappointed. I am frustrated. I am annoyed. I am confused. I am jealous. Whatever these ugly, strong emotions are, identify with it so you can begin to alter it. Then the S, you want to sit with it. This doesn't have to be months in the making. It could be a few days. It can be a few weeks, whatever it is. You want to sit with it. Now that you've gone through the N, the O, and the I, now you want to see in your life consciously with some self-awareness when it arrives in your life. Is it a certain time of day? Is it around a certain topic, around a certain person? What is really causing this emotion habitually to overrun your body? Sit with it and make note of that because eventually you're going to be able to see it coming. You're going to be able to put some space between you and the trigger of the emotion happening. And now you're creating some space where you're like, oh, I see that that was just about to happen. But if I'm a little more aware it doesn't have to. It's like a habit. If you tune in and say, oh my God, I've been biting my nails for five minutes. I didn't even realize it. But if you immediately put your fingers to your mouth and you're like, wait a minute, no, no, no. I, I, I'm not going to bite my mouth's nails. And you're aware of it. Now you don't have to. And you do that more and more often. Eventually you'll create the necessary space and you'll reflect upon it using this system. And then the E will take you effortlessly right through what you want to go for, which is the fact that you will evolve into the person you've always been. I love it. How did you come up with that? Did you, is that something that you authored and then yep. lived it and then now put out there kind of like Hal and Savers? Correct. I, through, through this post 40 years in hiding, um, I, I, I've become very self-aware and reflective and uh, um, just taking personal responsibility of like, oh, that, that's on me. What did I do? What didn't work? Why did that happen? I could have done that differently, uh, but I'm not going to beat myself up. Okay. Yeah. So it helps if you don't beat yourself up, the, which is, you know, one of the things now um, getting to a point like this is never, well, now I'm just perfect and nothing ever happens to me. Right. So, um, but, but now it's about reducing the amount of time that you stay in these non-serving places mentally, emotionally, and how quickly you can get yourself out of them and moving on. So having just looked back on how did I get from there to here? I then, you know, put put some of these things down in writing and then I noticed, wow, there's a F that noise somewhere in here. <laughs> it works. The branding and the marketing lays out itself. Uh, and I actually hate, as a branding professional, I hate putting like the business side to it because it's so, as you said, authentically, like your young self kind of coming to like fruition and it's all the journey comes to like that meeting point and phew, here we are. Yeah. Um, you talked a lot about uh, basically dimming the light and not and worried about, um, you know, kind of overshadowing shadowing other people. And I've absolutely experienced that firsthand. And I always think that universe, universe, God, Madonna, whatever you believe, kind of serves you in, in ways until you pivot. And I've had to go through it many, like run through the wall until it's like, you know this, no, come on. Um, and a lot of that came through like personal management, meaning I was helping kind of guide the journeys of influencers. And a lot of times I'd be seeing that I'd be like, Oh, like, I think I know more than this. And I don't know that I agree with this and yet I'm promoting it. And I'm actually helping like this. It was like intrinsically, like I could feel the tension in my body. And like, I actually had things, um, again, I'm deep in the health world. So I would like test my liver and I had like high liver, liver enzymes, which is associated with anger. And we, this is a whole podcast in itself, but your body will physically manifest these out of alignment situations. But I had, you know, kind of this fear of like, be like, again, dip, like overshadowing, especially when I'm promoting someone else's cause and I was dimming the light. Um, and I really had to unpack that from like my childhood with like three brothers and like, you know, they're military. And so it was kind of like, you know, I was mm. this kind of kid and I fell back even as much as like I'm out here in orange and, you know, the most, most of the time it, it really, I would pull back a lot. How did you like, where did that stem from for you? Cause I mean, that base piece was really the, the guide for the rest of the journey. Yeah. So growing up, I just found myself um, 
feeling isolated. I, I'm the youngest of three sons. My older brothers are six and nine years older than me. So there's a little bit of a gap there that, you know, by the time I was, you know, of, of age that I could even remember anything, they were out running about playing with their friends. So I felt alone and isolated there. And I just never felt the strength to stick up for myself in any way. Um, one, well, there's actually two stories that come to mind when I was probably in middle school age, um, a friend of mine, and I'll use that term loosely because, you know, a friend like this, who needs enemies? But uh, a friend of mine was over and I was a baseball card collector as a child. Uh, I had a big collection. I inherited my brother's collections. Um, and that was really, you know, what kept me busy growing up. Uh, my friend came over one day and asked, to look at my baseball cards. And I was like, yeah, sure. So I took a lot of the good ones out. And then all of a sudden I see him, which, you know, I, I don't claim to be any sort of, um, any sort of person who, who can spot anything, but he was so obvious, so obviously stealing my baseball cards he would like look at them and then almost out of like a bad movie like just like do like a little gimmicky thing and then like put it in his pocket and you know just what? like a uh, yeah it was crazy and guess what i said to him absolutely nothing oh. nothing came out of my mouth and he did it more than once wow. because you know, I guess he quote unquote knew that, you know, he can get away with this and he was absolutely right. So I said nothing instead of saying, uh, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Um, I'd like my, my baseball cards back, please. That you just put in your pocket quite comically. And obviously I didn't say a word. Wow. I, I didn't say, that's how deep this ran. I'll give you one other uh, story example. In the summer, around the same age, 12, 13, 14 years old in the summer, I went to day camp at our local park. And my best friend at the time, he would ride over to my house on his bike and we would then bike over together. He would pick me up. Uh, he would ring my doorbell eight o'clock in the morning every morning. I'd you know, be ready to come down and we'd, we, we'd cycle over. So one morning, the doorbell rings, I shoot out of bed. I'm like, oh my God, I must have overslept. So I run downstairs and I tell him, I was like, give me five minutes. Just, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll be five minutes. So I quickly do everything I can, get ready, run out the door, and now I'm ready to go with him. But before I ran out the door, I noticed that it wasn't 8.05, it was 7.05. And my friend had come an hour early. So I didn't oversleep. He was just way early. So now we are 7.05 leaving for the park. What do you think I said to him when I noticed the error? Absolutely nothing. Wow. Not even like, yo, man, you just, you're an hour early. Look, I'm going to go back to bed. Why yeah. don't you come back in an hour? Or even like, hey, man, you're an hour early. This is crazy. You want to hang out or should we go to the, what do you want to do? You're an hour early. But I was that, that distraught about calling people out on yeah. any level. It's just crazy. It's, I, it's funny to look, think back at some stuff. I have stories so similar to that where I'm like, and I was honestly even like morally worse where I had friends doing things where it's like, I, I know you're you have an inappropriate relationship with our coach or I know this. And I'm like, and I don't, I mean, there, and there's so much there to unpack. It's, it is so much easier to just look the other way, but again, it will eat you. And, and again, the more you get to know your core values, like mine is honesty and transparency is number one. And that doesn't mean I'm more honest than other people or anything like that. But like you have certain things that we really grasp onto. And that's one of my first one. So that's why my body literally was like physically rejecting some of these things. Mm. But I, I, I also think it's so good that you can reflect upon those stories, remember how you felt and now bring that to present day of mm -mm, no longer. I remember how that one instance made me feel now, you know, 40 years later or whatever, 30 years later, and here it is coming up on a podcast. Like you have to make these really conscious decisions. Um, so you never got the cards back or anything? <laughs> <laughs> no, never got the cards back. Would they be worth anything today? 
I couldn't even tell you because I don't know which ones he took. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think yeah. the lesson might've been worth more than the card. So I think it all yeah. panned out. Exactly. Um, now you got noise and F that noise and all these acronyms that are <laughs> impact society. Um, well, I'll do just fine financially. Hey, there you go. Uh, so on that note, what is, you know, we've, you, now that podcasting's new, I mean, newer, but like you're establishing the game, you, you're excited. I mean, it's, it's a pivot point. What's exciting to you moving forward? Like what's the goal as far as personal, um, personal growth, you know, societal impact, business impact, uh, business goals. What's exciting to Josh? Well, this is what I love about the whole podcasting space is that you can make it as creative as you want, right? There's, there's not one strict mold of what a podcast can look like or sound like. I mean, proof is already out there, a million plus shows right now. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of creativity in the structure and the idea. So that's what I love. I, 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 I love, adore, and embrace creativity. And this whole medium gives you that playground. Mm -hmm. So I love that off of the bat. So as you know, what, what Eric and I are developing through, through PodMax is sort of taking the foundation of a podcast and really opening it up. So it started as this one day, all day event where entrepreneurs have the chance to come and record as a guest in one day on three top shows relevant to their industry. And in between the, the recordings, they experience a masterclass, education, and training. Great. We got a lot of great feedback on that. And then what we started noticing is people who were coming were established six and seven plus business owners. And they're saying, I'm not new to the uh, business game, but I'm new to podcasts. I, I don't know, or I, I've never been on one, or I've been on some, but I know I have some skill to learn. So we said, great, let's start figuring out a way to train and help these people prepare for the shows that we're going to get them on. So we started this pre-event training where we do just that. We help the entrepreneur identify, practice and rehearse and communicate their message because sometimes they don't know, they still have the doubt. What is my message? Does anybody care? Uh, and, then, and then we help them for that big event do just that. Now we're in, the, we're in the active space where we're talking to bigger players, uh, investors, and other big people who can help us take things to the next level, which is really understanding that we are in the transformation game. We're helping people grow their self-confidence, their self-awareness, grow their business through, because we're just using the podcast space as the vehicle, but everything we teach could be applied to your website, to your videos, to your social media, to your email, to your sales calls, right? There's no limit. So at its core, we're helping you like Eric and I both experienced, like we spoke about today. We're helping you use this to become the best version of yourself that you can to experience and to share your gift, to grow your self-worth, your self-value and your self-confidence through the space. So everything around what is and was the original PodMax all day event, we're now helping you prior to that identify and communicate that message. So when the big day comes, you really master and nail that. And then we have a bigger way where we're going to work with the entrepreneur month after month in a one-on-one -on -one way where you sit down with your dedicated show host. So picture each month sitting down with your version of Larry King or Barbara Walters. I love it. And their only goal is to make you look good, to share your message, to tell your stories. And what does that do? That one hour a month creates your one month marketing calendar. So now we take that and we do everything we possibly can to give you a month's worth of marketing material for that one hour commitment. And while you're still enjoying the you know, self-confidence and self-growth through your story. And that's just the tip of what we're doing in the big picture. I love it. I love where, first of all, it's people like you guys behind the mic. And I can't say, if you haven't heard any of my podcasts, but I talk a ton about PodMax and how much I've appreciated it and the human it attracts and what a quality situation it is all the way around. Um, it, it's a big deal. And it's, again, like I said, great that you guys are out there and you're anything but hidden right now. So it's, it's amazing to see that transformation. Unfortunately, my computer is at 1%, but 
Um, I, I, I just want to know one piece of advice you have for people that are going to get out there or looking to get out there, looking to podcast or make a move. And then where do we find you? Nobody cares. Nobody really <laughs> cares what you are doing. It's all going to, yeah, it's all going to be over in the blink of an eye, best case scenario. Like I said, if I live another 45 years, that's going to come and go like that. And what's it all going to mean? It's all going to mean whatever I make it mean right here and right now. Nobody cares what you are doing. Just make yourself feel good through the actions you are taking. Figure out what's going to make you feel good and why you're doing it and do it. And so can well find, said. Well, thank you. People can find me at joshcarry.com. <laughs> Nobody cares. Look him up. Uh, no, I, 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 think, <laughs> dude, I think that's huge. I, I might even title this cast. Nobody cares. I, no one will get it until they listen to it, which I is love fine. it. Welcome Please to Tequila. Um, no. But I think it's huge. I appreciate your energy. I appreciate all you're putting out there. And it's been a wonderfully um, coaching piece in my podcast and just like human existence. There's so many like golden nuggets, as you guys say. Uh, that I've been able to like keep in the back of my life. Oh, what are they doing? Or here's how they do it. Thank you for joining Turmeric and Tequila with your host, Kristen Olson. Tune in next time. And don't forget to subscribe on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen.